reading from Jeremiah chapter 23, beginning at verse 9. My heart within me is broken. Because of the prophets, all my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, and like a man whom wine has overcome. Because of the Lord, and because of his holy words. For the land is full of adulterers. For because of a curse, the land mourns. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up. Their course of life is evil, and their might is not right. For both prophet and priest are profane. Yes, in my house I have found their wickedness, says the Lord. Therefore their way shall be to them like slippery ways. In the darkness they shall be driven on and fall in them, for I will bring disaster on them. The year of their punishment, says the Lord. And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied by Baal and caused my people Israel to err. Also, I have seen a horrible thing in the prophets of Jerusalem. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They also strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns back from his wickedness. All of them are like Sodom to me and their inhabitants like Gomorrah. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, profaneness has gone out into all the land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. They continually say to those who despise me, the Lord has said, you shall have peace. And to everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, they say, no evil shall come upon you. For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and has perceived and heard his word? Who has marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places? So I shall not see him, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I've heard what the prophets have said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies. Indeed, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone tells his neighbor as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Let's read that together. 29. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? No wonder the Bible has survived so many attempts to discredit and destroy it because it is the power of God unto salvation. Now today our series 
brings us to chapter 23 in Jeremiah, which contains, among other vital lessons, a summons to consider and critically examine our sources of information. So let me ask you, where do you turn when you have a question, a project, or a conundrum for which you need reliable answers? Well, probably most of us would turn to the internet, of course, right? Actually, that's nothing new as of 2010. The internet was identified as the single most popular source of global information. More than eight in 10 US adults, according to a Pew survey, 86% say that they get their news from a smartphone, computer, or tablet. That means television, the radio, and the newspaper have gone the way of the dodo bird. But it isn't always so. In 1693, an English printer named William Anderton was tried at the Central Criminal Court in England and Wales for high treason, presumably because he had published two tracts or pamphlets criticizing then King William III. Anderton also called for the restoration of the late King James II. So on May the 2nd, 1693, Anderton's hidden printing press was discovered by authorities and he was arrested and later condemned to death. Now, Anderton's defense centered on a claim that as a post-medieval technology, printing could not be construed as a form of treason under the 1352 Treason Act, and that as a mechanical activity, it could not be used to demonstrate malicious intent. In spite of the defense, bullied by lies, the jury convicted Anderton, and he was hung. Further legal arguments and appeals by Anderton's wife and others were rejected. He was the only printer, by the way, executed between 1664 and 1719. If they were to be effective, the slender threads of control available to William III's reign had to resort to underhanded, illegal, unethical tactics. William Anderton's fate is a grim reminder that being bold to speak the truth or print the truth has serious consequences even in a supposed free and enlightened country. America considers itself an enlightened country, allowing for a degree of debate and exchange of ideas, but that is not entirely true. Closely intertwined with the stories we hear daily, there are falsehoods, there are errors, there are inaccuracies which are intentionally being propagated by self-interest and self-declared elites. Jeremiah knew something of that kind of activity and sinister motives as he sought in the counterfeit prophets of his day. Now you may recall that Jeremiah was a priest by birth and he was an, a prophet by appointment. Yet he was deeply grieved by what some of the prophets were doing in his own day. And during his 40 year career in which he served under the last five kings of Judah, that's Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. But what gave him the most grief was his fellow religious leaders, the priests and the prophets. And although he said comparatively little about the priests, he railed against the prophets more than any other prophet in the Old Testament because of that, we have in this book of Jeremiah the most penetrating analysis and distinction between the true and the false prophet anywhere in the Bible. What specifically produced all of this anguish, you say, in Jeremiah's soul? Well, think of it this way. As of March last year, March 2023, there were one million deaths due to COVID-19 that far in the United States. Now, recognizing that even to this day, many believe that the American public was duped uh, about various details of the pandemic. All that aside, imagine if COVID-19 arrived on our shores uh, when it did, and the entire government medical agency vested with protecting public health in America colluded to hide all information about the virus. Well, Jeremiah saw his nation facing two crises. First was the profaning of 
God's worship by the priests. The priests and the prophets were polluting the temple with pagan or semi-pagan practices. Secondly, the country was facing a serious environmental crisis. There was a drought. I know that's hard to take into mind, living in Pittsburgh, but the land and the pastures were parched, they were bone dry, uh, and God sent this drought as punishment since the land was full of adulterers. You say, well now what does that mean? Well, does it mean spiritual adultery or does it mean physical, literal adultery? Both. Here's why. Spiritual adultery always leads to promiscuous behavior. Mark it down. And this drought was a sign of God's judgment. But you know what? The false prophets wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. In the opening verses of this chapter, Jeremiah described the coming of the future Messiah, the righteous sprout or branch from David's stump or David's fallen dynasty. And under the Messiah, Judah would be saved and Israel would live in safety. And this was in contrast to all of these religious and uh, civic leaders of the day who did a pathetic job of leading. The Jews were banished from their own land. They had been scattered, but under this Messiah, Jesus Christ, God would bring the people back and they would eventually live in their own land again and they would live under Christ's rule, hallelujah. That's coming in the millennium. But meanwhile, God graded the prophets and the priests and he gave them an F minus. All were godless in their conduct and in their behavior, in the temple. And for that reason, God promised to put them in a slippery place, to give them a slippery future. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was young and spry, I didn't think too much about slippery places. In fact, I sought them out, ice skating and slaying in the winter. But by certain age, everything changed, especially with injury. And now I try to avoid slippery places. But the fact of the matter is, it's not the fall that bothers me, it's the sudden stop. Imagine God telling these two religious classes, priests and prophets, that he was going to make their path slippery. He was going to bring disaster upon them. It's good to remember that religious position, not only that of the pastor, but of all church leaders and members, is no exemption from God's holy and just judgment in any generation, in any nation, or in any church. Now, in spite of both classes being implicated, God singled out the false prophets for special dishonor and disgrace. And God saw it, and Jeremiah declared it, that there were four basic classes of false prophets. First, were those who pursued an evil course and used their position and their influence unjustly. The false prophets, you have to understand, had a large and enthusiastic audience and were very popular because they could sound so persuasive. In fact, in Elijah's day, his confrontation on Mount Carmel involved 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, Baal's female consort. So 850 altogether. Compare that with 100 prophets of the Lord whom Obadiah took and he hid them in two caves, 50 in each cave, because Jezebel, Ahab's wife, was out to kill them. Elijah and Jeremiah's messages were stern and unpopular by contrast because they exposed sin. They didn't sugarcoat anything. They showed the leaders and the people had seriously violated God's covenant. Now the second group were the lying prophets. These were the prophets who announced, I had a dream, I had a dream. Now it's time to recognize that while it's true that the God used the dream and vision method to reveal new truth, 
You may remember that as Peter was up on the rooftop uh, waiting for dinner to be prepared down below, he saw a great sheet let down from heaven and in that sheet were all sorts of unclean animals and a voice came to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And that was a revelation informing Peter that God was now opening the door, as it were, to the Gentile world, not just the Jews, to hear the gospel. But the lying prophets in Jeremiah's day were saying, I have a dream, but really it was just their own deluded opinions, not God's word. Now, when I was a teenager, one of the most popular cults in America was the Worldwide Church of God. It was founded in 1934 in Eugene, Oregon, as the, the uh, Radio Church of God by none other than Herbert W. Armstrong. He was succeeded by his son, then I remember Garner Ted Armstrong. And although local churches rejected Armstrong, initially his radio show gained a following, and in 1947 they relocated to Pasadena, California and established an actual physical organized church. The Worldwide Church of God believed that God was the Father and that all human beings could eventually become God. Does that sound familiar? Now Armstrong considered the Trinity uh, of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit to be satanic. Although the church believed in tithing, tithes were three times higher in his church than traditional churches. Eventually, the Worldwide Church of God built a reputation as a doomsday cult uh, after Herbert Armstrong began to preach about end times and the return of Christ, which he initially predicted to occur uh, between 1975 and 1978. He told his congregation they would be saved if they followed his advice his guidance. Now the most attractive cults are those who feign a warm and welcoming environment. They promise to nourish you with health and, and riches and success and often employ worldly tactics like that of appealing to a human being and turning that human being into an idol instead of surrendering to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now the reason many people fall prey to cults, whether it's Jehovah Witnesses, Mormonism, or any ism today, it's because they haven't had their heart and mind exercised to spiritual discernment. They never stood in the counsel of the Lord. Hold on to that, I'll come back to it in a minute. The third group of false prophets were those who wagged their tongues freely um, prefacing their announcements with, thus says the Lord, in order to give their preaching a ring of official authority and authenticity. But the truth is that their words only made people dig in their heels and continue in their sin. They never challenged the people. They never called them to repent. The fourth group of false prophets were those who preferred and put nationalism before God. In short, they argued, hey, listen, uh, what's good for the national morale of the country is more important than God's warning. They said, peace, peace, when there was no peace. Judgment was coming. And they were still out mocking God. Now, whatever the individual style of the false prophet. God's evaluation was the same. He said, I never sent them. He said, they run with the message, but, but it's not from me. He said, they actually never stood in my counsel. Because if they did, by now, their preaching would have resulted in people repenting of their sin and turning from their evil deeds and returning to me. What then does that mean when it says, but if they had stood in my counsel. Well, the image is that of a king 
The king is surrounded, as you would expect, by his closest associates. There's members of his council who are trusted servants. There are members of his council who are advisors. Uh, they're always ready to do his bidding at a moment's notice. They stand in his council. They share a deeper insight into his sovereign purposes and agenda and what he is planning to do. Now, not unlike the false prophets of Jeremiah's day, our world is has no shortage of people who uh, are ready to offer you their advice, even if you don't ask for it. Now, it might be on how to kill ants in your pantry. It might be about hoarding food and supplies for the upcoming world disaster, or it might be simply how to properly pepper spray a grizzly bear in Yellowstone. But if you want those specifics, please go to the internet and get them. Now, while all of these tips on subjects may be helpful, and I might even look up a few, uh, yet I would not rely on anyone, either on the internet or in print or in person, claiming to have died, gone to heaven or hell, and return uh, to tell me what it was all about and what I should expect. It's not that I don't care about eternity. It's not that I don't care about heaven. It's not that I don't fear hell. It's that I care too much to leave it to somebody's subjective experience. Second Peter tells me his divine power has given me everything necessary for a godly life through the knowledge of him who has called me to glory and virtue. Jesus never said anything about Someone going through a long tunnel and seeing a light at the end of the tunnel and that confirming that there must be a heaven. What if at the end of that tunnel that light is fire? But he did say, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be who go in thereat. Furthermore, Revelation 20.11 says, I saw the dead, small and great, and they were standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Is anybody going to get to heaven? and tell God what he should do? God says it's in the book. I have a book. And if your name is there, wonderful. If it's not, now it's wonderful to listen to godly people. It's good to listen to intelligent people, knowledgeable people, but Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. God told Jeremiah to tell the people, hmm, let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, and let the one who speaks my word speak it faithfully. What is chaff to do with wheat? Chaff is the part that blows away and you burn it. Wheat is the thing you take and you eat. And then he says, is not my word like a fire? And isn't it like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? True prophets and false prophets are distinguishable as chaff is from grain. And the word of God is distinguishable in its effect. It is a fire. It consumes and it purifies. It consumes the evil and the darkness in our lives and it purifies us. And if we're not undergoing that, there is a good question to ask ourselves whether or not we're listening to this or we're listening to something else. During the German invasion, of Holland. Planes, as you know, shattered the night skies with artillery fire, and Betsy Ten Boom 
Um, and her sister, Corey, could not sleep one night, so Betsy got up first uh, and went down to make a cup of tea, and Corey followed her. And uh, as they talked, finally, the fighter planes, uh, the noise and the bombing and the explosions uh, quieted down a bit, and they both stumbled back to their bedrooms, and Corey reached into her bed, and she took her pillow to, to fluff it up again, and uh, all of a sudden, she uh, felt a, a sharp, piercing, cutting her hand. A jagged piece of munitions came through the roof and right through her pillow into her bed would have killed her. Corey immediately cried out to Betsy and both ran back downstairs and Betsy cleaned and bandaged Corey's hand. And as she did, Corey turned to Betsy and she said, Betsy, if I hadn't heard you in the kitchen. Betsy interrupted her. Don't say it, Corey. There are no ifs in God's world. The center of his will is our only safety. Now you're here this morning and you're asking, well, what, what, how does all of this affect me? Well, here's how. Jesus said, you are my witnesses. What are you witnessing about? Only telling what Jesus Christ has done. That's all we have to tell. We don't have anything to tell about ourselves. We don't have anything to tell about our church. We don't have anything to tell about our families. The preeminent thing that we have to share is Jesus Christ. And it's a great responsibility to share the gospel because the way I present it the way you present it, either encourages somebody to accept it or reject it. Now, whether I speak it from the pulpit or you speak it or teach it in a Sunday school class or you share it uh, with someone over a cup of coffee in a restaurant, remember this. The weapons of our warfare, spiritual warfare, are not carnal. but they're mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now I could sit down with someone who has chosen an alternate lifestyle, um, perhaps um, one of these uh, that are in the news so much and celebrated so much. My job is to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. This book is not about me. It's not about you. It's about what God has done through Jesus Christ to deliver sinners from the wrath to come. There will be a judgment day. There will be a day when you and I will stand at the judgment seat of Christ to answer for everything that we have done in the body. But right now, meanwhile, God's word is a fire that consumes and a hammer that shatters the rock. Amen. Jesus Christ came to call you and me, our family members, out of danger, into life, he stood in the counsel of the Lord God Almighty. He said, I always do those things that please my Father. The question is this. Have you received him?
Now, I don't just mean a cerebral intellectual process. I mean, have you received him in the sense that you've given him the full measure of control over your life? And you're living not by doubt. You're not living by uh, subjective experience. You're not living by what others... You're living by the control of his Holy Spirit. You're walking in the Spirit so that you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You're experiencing daily his overcoming power in you and through you. Do you know the security of standing in the counsel of the Lord? You say, Pastor, I, I don't know that I do. I mean, I've been following what I was taught as a child. Well, now that may be good or it may not be. But put it under the microscope. Look at it through the microscope. Here it is. And see whether what you've been told actually stands up to the truth. And then you'll know, just as God has promised. Great peace have they which love thy law. And nothing, nothing shall offend them. Amen.